Hi, ladies. Welcome to Women in the Word. I'm Shelley Davis. I'm part of the Women in the Word teaching team. I love Women in the Word, and I love being here with each of you to study God's Word every single week. Thank you for joining us. Now, the house that Billy and I've lived in for the last 40 years was actually built in 1923. So it does not have a modern attached garage like houses do today. Instead, we have a long driveway and we have an automatic gate that we press a button and it opens and closes for us when we pull into our driveway. And what we laugh about with our automatic gate is how our dogs respond. Now, they stand, when our dogs are outside in the yard, they stand all day long, paws up on that gate like prisoners waiting to break out into the world and see what's out there. But the minute we drive up and press the button to open that automatic gate, they stop, they stand perfectly still, they never run out the gate. Instead, they turn around and run back to our house and they wait for us, and then they greet us when we get out of the car. They get all those pets and uh, affection and an occasional treat as well. And then when that gate is firmly closed, they run back to the gate, pause up again like prisoners waiting to break out. And all of our dogs have done this. In fact, our older dogs always teach the new puppy don't be running out the gate. Stand right here until we get to greet our people as they get out of the car. I realized as I was studying these two great chapters that we're going to look at today that our dogs were simply reflecting exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about abiding and remaining, and that's what our sweet puppies are doing as they stay in our yard. They're abiding with the people that nurture them and care for them and provide for them as they remain in the environment that they have been given. So turn with me to John chapter 15, and let's look at the choice that we have to abide in our true vine even as we remain in the world. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 in chapter 15, so follow along with me. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be more fruitful. Now, there's some differing opinions about whether Jesus continued his words that we started last week in the upper room with the Passover dinner with Jesus and his disciples, whether he continued his words in the upper room or whether they changed locations as they made their way towards the Mount of Olives. But what matters here is not where they are. What matters is what Jesus is telling his disciples in these final hours. And in these first verses, Jesus speaks the last of the seven I am statements. We've already studied the other six, along with being the bread of life, the light of the world, the door to salvation, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus tells us here that he is the true vine. He also tells us that God the Father is the vine dresser or the master gardener. He is the master gardener and it is God the Father who is responsible for the spiritual garden that Jesus begins to talk about here in chapter 15. It is uh, originally Israel was uh, God's carefully cultivated vine in his spiritual garden garden. He prepared the soil. He planted the seed beginning with his friend Abraham. He lavished care and attention through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He brought the 12 tribes of Israel out of Egypt into the land that he had carefully prepared for them. Look at what the psalmist says about that on, in Psalm 80 verses 8 and 9 on your verse sheet. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. But Israel, God's precious vine, has now become corrupt 
and diseased, producing only the rotten fruit of rebellion instead of the loving obedience, righteousness, and justice that God desired from Israel. Look at what the prophet Jeremiah has to say in Jeremiah 2.21. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? In light of Israel's deterioration, Jesus reveals to his disciples here in these last hours that he has with them that he is actually the true vine, meaning that he is the one who is now going to bring fulfillment to everything that God had previously desired from Israel. God's desire for a spiritual vineyard, a spiritual garden filled with the spiritual fruit of righteousness, godly character, holiness would now grow out of a connection to God's true vine, Jesus. But our gardener here, we see in verse two, has work to do, doesn't he? As he tends his spiritual garden that is planted with the true vine. For those branches that do not bear fruit, our ESV translation says he takes them away. You may have an NIV that says cut off or another translation, but there are two possible meanings for the Greek word ero right here that is translated take away in the ESV. The first one is that about unbelievers. The first meaning could be about unbelievers and it's those who profess to follow Jesus, but have never really had the true heart change that comes with believing in Jesus. They may identify as Christian to you upon occasion, but they've never experienced salvation by faith alone and Christ alone. Judas is going to fall into this category. He certainly followed Jesus. He sat at his table but Judas was never transformed, as far as we can discern, into a true follower of Jesus by his belief. The fruit in Judas's life was the rotten fruit of rebellion. But there is another possible meaning for the Greek word translated take away or cut off here. It could also have been translated lifted up which would signal another meaning. It would signal that these branches that are possibly not bearing fruit at the moment are believers that need some extra care in their life. The gardener would need to lift them up off of the ground so that they would become healthy. So right here as we began chapter 15, we have two possible meanings, either the gardener participates in cutting off unbelievers um, or the gardener lifts up believers who are in need of extra cultivation. But we do find out the gardener has more work to do with branches that do bear fruit. The divine gardener also has to prune those branches that do bear fruit. And pruning here represents the discipline process in all of our lives where God purifies our character and works on our sinful habits, often through difficult circumstances in our lives. He trims and cuts away at our life and takes out that sin so that we can grow spiritually healthy, strong, and very fruitful in God's kingdom. All of us have circumstances in our lives, don't we? We all have relationships and jobs and finances and health issues that are sometimes difficult. And it's all of those things that God uses in our lives to prune pride and selfishness and legalism and greed and other sins that are permeating our lives. My mother-in-law was always convinced that children were God's pruning project. And over the years, I came to believe in that with her. Her favorite saying was, children keep us humble. Children keep us humble. In other words, God is pruning our pride out of our lives as parents through our children. Read a few more verses with me. Look at verse four. <clears throat> Abide in me and I in you. Um, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, 
you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Now the word abide, or it may be translated remain in your Bible, is a key word in John's theology. He uses it actually 11 times in chapter 15 alone. And it has the concept of both believing in Jesus initially and persevering in that belief. All believers abide in Jesus when we are talking about a saving faith. But here Jesus uses it also to talk about the intimate faith that comes from purposefully pursuing a deep and nourishing relationship with the Savior, um, a growing relationship, um, a dependent fellowship on the Savior, you know, which grows you more like Him every single day. You know, it's true that those people that we connect with, that we spend the most time with, that we have intimate relationships with. You know, if you think about it, you begin to talk more like them and act more like them and have their principles and their views on life. Sometimes we even begin to look like those people that we spend a lot of time with. That's what John is talking about here. And Jesus is sharing with us about abiding in him. If you consider the imagery of the vine here, you see that there has to be a solid, healthy connection of a branch to a vine in order for the nutrients to, to flow up that branch and up that vine into the branch because a branch does not provide its own nourishment, does it? It doesn't have roots. It doesn't connect to the water in the soil. It doesn't gather nutrients out of that soil. A branch is dependent on the roots of the vine in order for that to happen. Nourishment comes from the main vine rooted in the soil flowing up into the branch. Our spiritual lives are just like that, ladies. It, they only produce fruit, godly character, holiness, godly actions that bring glory to God's spiritual garden when we are solidly and constantly connected to the true vine as well. Jesus is actually blunt with his disciples here because he tells them, apart from that solid, nourishing connection to him, they're going to be able to do nothing. It won't matter whatever ministry is placed in their hands if they are not abiding in him, solidly connected. We have a huge pecan tree in our backyard, and it produces so many pecans every year that in the fall they completely cover our yard, our driveway, our deck. Honestly, I think that may be the reason the dogs abide with us is because they love eating those pecans every year. But you know what? When a branch blows off of that pecan tree and lays in the yard, it never produces pecans again. I can water it. I can fertilize it. But that branch disconnected from the pecan tree is never going to produce pecans. As believers, when we become separated from our true vine by our choices or by our circumstances, what we lose is the opportunity to grow godly character or actions in our lives. But we need to be careful here because what Jesus is talking about here in John 15, losing our intimacy with him, the true vine, he's not talking about losing our salvation. Jesus' conversation here about abiding in the vine is about sanctification. It's about how we grow more like him every single day. This is not a conversation he's having about eternal salvation. Believers can become disconnected from the vine. They can have um, a, a saving faith, an eternal destination because they have at some point trusted in Jesus. But when they become disconnected from that vine because of the cares of life or other circumstances or rebellion, they become like the branches that Jesus is talking about in verse 6 that are thrown away, tossed in the fire. You know, the branches on my pecan tree that blow off never produce 
pecans again, but they're still pecan branches, aren't they? They still have pecan wood. If I burn them in my fireplace, I can smell that pecan odor in them. Branches that become disconnected from the true vine are believers whose unfaithfulness to the Savior keeps them from glorifying God in their lives. They haven't lost their salvation, but they have lost their opportunity to make a difference in God's kingdom. They have lost their opportunity for those rewards when they finally meet Jesus face to face. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 7 with me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in me. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples must be interesting for them because they have actually been living with Jesus, abiding with him, remaining with him physically every day for the last two and a half years or so. But now when he's getting ready to leave them and he's been upfront about that, he's talking about remaining closely connected to to him. It must be a little bit um, concerning but it is because of his physical departure that he challenges them to stay intimately connected to him. And he shares three important insights into staying connected to him as the true vine, even though his physical presence is going to be removed from them. And the first one, the uh, first thought that he tells us here is they will stay connected to the true vine, to Jesus through his words, through his words. Abide in me and have my words abide in you. That's the wisdom he shares with them. They need to remember his words because his words are divine truth. His words are going to bring wisdom and teaching into their lives. Look at Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. He does want his words to dwell in his disciples, even though he will not be physically present with them. But more than just remembering his words, what he's really admonishing or directing them here to do is that his words need to be the authority in their life, need to be the authority that they live by. He's Um, His meaning here about his words is obedience and commitment to to all that he has taught them. That is what is going to connect them intimately to him after he goes to the Father. And you know, that has been what he has modeled for them the entire time that they have walked together and lived together. He has modeled obedience and commitment, perfect obedience to the Father. And their continued connection to him as the true vine is going to require that same obedience and commitment that they've seen him show to the Father during their time together. Now, the third insight that Jesus gives his disciples into abiding in him after he leaves them is prayer. Prayer. Jesus tells them to pray. He says here, ask whatever you wish. It will be done to you. Communicate your needs to me. You know, when they've been living together physically, they've been able to tell him directly what their needs are. And during his ministry with them, he's modeled prayer as well because he has remained closely connected to God the Father through his frequent frequent prayer conversations. He knows the importance of prayer in maintaining that fellowship that they have with him We can't be confused here by his words. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. The prayers of those who abide in the vine, what the lesson he's giving them here with those words is that the prayers of those who abide in the vine are fruitful. They're fruitful, not because they have a blank check of prayer, but because those who abide in an intimate, obedient fellowship with the true vine, with Jesus, will conform their prayers and their hearts to the will of 
God. John gives us some more insight into what Jesus is talking about here in 1 John 5, 14. He says, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us. Ask according to his will and your prayers will be fruitful. Now, I can't imagine how hard it is for the disciples to lose the physical presence of Jesus. But Jesus knows that they can remain in close fellowship, rejoicing in the fruit that is going to grow out of their relationship with him, even in his absence. And the reason he knows that is he's experienced it. That's exactly what he has experienced as he left the Father's physical presence when he came for our salvation. He left the Father's physical presence, but he didn't leave the Father's love, did he? Because he kept the Father's commands. His disciples, he tells them here, they're now going to have that same experience that he had. They're not going to have his physical presence, but they will have his love. They will bear much fruit as they keep his commands. Read a couple more verses with me. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love no one has than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I commanded. You know, a few years ago, there was a popular phrase going around among um, Christian youth groups. In fact, they still may use it. Uh, it was concerning dating and sexual purity. It was true love waits. True love waits. There were t-shirts and bumper stickers and seminars all about true love waits. If Jesus had a slogan for love in this world, I think from these verses we would know that it is true love sacrifices. True love sacrifices. Jesus' standard for love that he shares with his disciples is humble self-sacrifice for others. Humble self-sacrifice for others. That's what we looked at last week as we saw Jesus stand up from the table, take off his outer garments and wash 24 feet of his disciples. It's what he asks of everyone that follows him as well. Humble self-sacrifice for others. Several years ago, there was a team of Christ Chapel women that traveled to Africa to minister to African women in their churches in East Africa. And while we were there, we met a delightful young African man named JJ. And he desired to come to Texas to seminary. There wasn't a seminary in his part of the world. When JJ was finally able to realize that dream, a group of us met him at the airport when he finally arrived. Uh, he called us his Texas mamas, and we've taken care of him actually ever since, since he's been here. Uh, we knew that he would probably arrive without much in the way of clothing. Of course, he had a few things, but being in um, a first world country, we know what it takes to go to school and work and that sort of thing. So we were prepared to make sure that JJ had everything that he needed, even though he only came with one small bag of clothing. We took him to eat after we picked him up from the airport, and we discovered that he had even less than we might have imagined because during a layover in another country, it was either, I think it was Nairobi that he laid over in on his way to Texas, JJ met a man who had even less than he did in the airport. So JJ opened up his small bag of clothing and took out some of his clothing and gave them to the man at the airport. Those that Jesus calls his friends love others sacrificially, humble self-sacrifice for others. I don't have any doubt that JJ and Jesus are friends. Look at verse 18 with me. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. 
You know, the incredible blessing of being called Jesus's friends unfortunately comes with somewhat of a downside, doesn't it? The downside, according to Jesus, is that the world is going to hate those that Jesus is friends with. John uses the word world here to mean the organized society that is opposed to God, that is hostile to God. And Jesus, we know, was hated from his birth until his death, wasn't he? Herod sent soldiers to find him and kill him, even as a baby. Even as a baby, there was a death warrant out for Jesus. And the reason that the world hates Jesus' followers is we are different from the world. Jesus has taken us out of the world. By our faith, we have stepped from the darkness of the world into the light And the darkness hates the light, doesn't it? John has been talking about that throughout his gospel. Look at John 3, 19 with me. And this is judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And it is the light of Jesus that exposes sin. No longer does the world who hates Jesus have an excuse for sin if they willfully reject what he's done for them. He has atoned for the sacrifice, for the sin of the world by his blood, and it has been rejected by the world that hates him. The fruit of abiding in Jesus is godly character and righteousness. But here he's clear with his disciples. He wants them to know there is going to be a fallout as well. Abiding in Jesus means they will be hated and persecuted by the world. And that is the future that Jesus is predicting for his friends here. But notice that he doesn't tell his disciples to run and hide. Instead, what he does is he gives them a peek behind the curtain of life after Pentecost, after the helper that he's going to send arrives. Look at verses 26 and 27 with me. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. They're not to run from the world. They're not to hide. Instead, they should anticipate and I think be excited about the help that he is going to send to them. The Holy Spirit would arrive from God the Father to spread the truth. And the world's hatred is going to be no match for the spirit of truth that was coming. The world's hatred is not going to be able to stop knowledge of the Savior spreading throughout the world. That is one of the great roles of the Holy Spirit in our world today. And the disciples are going to be part of that. Every disciple of Jesus gets to be part of that, spreading the truth as his witnesses. And these these disciples are going to be particularly important because they have intimate knowledge of Jesus, of all that he did, of all that he said, of everything his ministry was about, that is going to be the foundation and essence of their testimony he shares with them here. Empowered by the Spirit, abiding in Jesus, they would be powerful voices of truth regardless of the world's hatred and persecution. Now, earlier I said that John used the word abide or remain 11 times in this chapter. It's hard to miss that that is a theme of uh, chapter 15. But unfortunately, we can miss that in our lives, can't we? We can miss out on abiding or remaining or staying intimately connected to Jesus as the source of our spiritual nourishment because we're distracted. There is so much going on in our world today, isn't there? Need I mention the pandemic and everything that has been going on for the last year with that and may continue to go on? What a distraction that is to keep us all from abiding in Jesus. We have our devices. I don't know about you, but my phone is with me fairly constantly, a watch on my hand, and there are all these notices of, text messages and emails and phone calls and sales. I even get notices of things that are, I should buy on my phone. All of these are distractions. And we haven't even mentioned our personal problems, the hard things in our lives. All of these can disconnect us from the nourishment 
that we need to be getting each and every day with our true vine. But there is a simple strategy for abiding, a simple strategy that we can all do to remain in the true vine, and that is be intentional. Be intentional. We can be intentional by doing exactly what we're all doing right now, opening up our Bibles and becoming close with our Lord Jesus, learning his word, knowing how we can put ourselves under his authority of his word. We can be intentional by pursuing a conversation with Jesus every single day in prayer. We can be intentional in our obedience. You know, obedience doesn't just happen upon us. We don't stumble over obedience when we get out of bed every morning, do we? Obedience comes when we're intentional and our sacrificial love for others must be intentional as well. An intimate connection to our Lord Jesus that nourishes our hearts, that changes our lives, that grows us more like him, does not happen by accident. It happens when we are intentional. Now, Jesus has already told his disciples that he's leaving them. And even though he's been talking for the last few moments with them about abiding, the reality is his disciples are going to remain in the world, and he is not. He is going on to be with God the Father, and Jesus addresses their plight and their future without his physical presence in chapter 16. Look at verses 1 through 4 and 16 with me. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. You know, Jesus' point here is he does not want them to stumble. He doesn't want them to stumble after his death. What they're going to face is actually going to be pretty shocking to all of them. You know, most of the early believers in Jesus were Jewish. The synagogue was the center. The very fabric of their life was the synagogue. It was not just their opportunity to worship, but it was what their families revolved around, their holidays revolved around. Because of their belief in Jesus, they're going to be put out of their synagogues as heretics. We saw that back in chapter 9 with the parents of the blind man who refused to even answer the Pharisees about what had happened with their son because they were afraid. Look at John 9, 22 with me. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And more than that, more than just being put out of the synagogue, anyone that followed him after his death was going to be hunted and killed. The apostle Paul himself persecuted the first believers. He participated in the stoning of Stephen before Paul's own conversion. Look at Acts 7, 58. Then they cast him out of the city, meaning Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, who, of course, we know to be, later to be the apostle Paul. Jesus is not telling them these things about being put out of the synagogue and being killed to frighten them. His goal is to strengthen them as they remain in the world. His goal is that as they remember his words about persecution, that would grow their confidence in him and in their future ministry. They would not second guess themselves when persecution happened. They would not begin to think, hey, maybe we should walk away from this. Instead, they would know we're doing the right thing because Jesus told us this would happen. Look at verse seven with me. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And then drop your eyes down to verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. 
He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. You know, Jesus is death and departure is going to be filled with sorrow. It's going to be very painful for his disciples, but Jesus knows it's necessary. He tells them it's necessary. He also tells them it's to his advantage. This is going to help you. This Holy Spirit would come and continue the work that Jesus had done himself on earth, exposing the dark hearts and the lies of Satan. The greatest sin in the, that the world has ever known was the rejection and the murder of God own son, the work of the Holy Spirit was going to come and reveal that sin of unbelief in the world as the witnesses spread the gospel and the righteousness of Christ would also be revealed. It would be like a, a light broken open into the world as the world would be made known, as it would be made known to the world who Jesus really was with his atoning sacrifice, his death on the cross, his resurrection would be made known to the world. But because of their sorrow and their confusion, the disciples, Jesus says here, are not really able to process all the truth that he's giving them. You know, it's true if you've ever experienced grief, you just can't take things in like you normally do. You don't think like you normally do. And that's what he's acknowledging here with the disciples. It's going to be after the Spirit comes that they really put together all the pieces of this puzzle. This is the death that they're processing through, not only of their beloved friend, but this is going to be the death of their dream of Jesus as an earthly king, as a destroyer of the dominion of Rome. Jesus gets their inability to understand all that he's saying, but he also is excited that they're not going to be left confused forever. After his death and resurrection, it will be the Holy Spirit who guides them into all the truth about Jesus that they don't get now. All the things that they don't understand. It will be the Holy Spirit who also guides the minds and the hands of the New Testament authors. It will be the Holy Spirit who witnesses through these disciples over and over again after the church is born at Pentecost. If you have time, go read through the first few chapters of Acts and you see what Jesus is talking about here actually happened. Now, in a past life, I was a labor and delivery nurse, so I had the opportunity to stand by the beds of many um, great women who were going through the pains of childbirth. And one of the things I did every single time I had a laboring mom was to remind her that in just a few hours, everything that she was experiencing during labor, the pain, the needle sticks, the uncertainty would be worth it. It would be worth it because in just a few hours, she was going to be holding that cute baby that she anticipated for so long. Jesus actually understood that analogy. He talks about it here in the scriptures. He knows that from the time of his arrest, coming shortly to his Sunday morning resurrection, his disciples are going to be in deep grief while the world rejoiced. But he also knew the end of the story. He knows the end of the story. They would see him again and their grief would turn to unbelievable joy. Look at what he says about that in verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. And drop your eyes down to verse 22. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus would be resurrected. His death would be forever defeated and the joy that the disciples have at his resurrection would never end because Jesus would now live forever. He would never die again, ever. Look at Romans 6, 9 on your verse sheet. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Jesus also points them here as he moves them closer to the time of his death. He wants them to know that not only is their grief going to turn to joy forever, but there is a new 
day that is coming, a new day that is coming. Uh, look at verse 25 with me, where he talks about the new day that's coming. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Um, a day was coming following Jesus' resurrection when his disciples are going to have a true and complete understanding of everything that Jesus does on the cross, of Jesus' atoning death on the cross. And they're also going to have a day of access and intimacy to God the Father himself through the name of Jesus. They're no longer going to have to have a priest at the temple make a sacrifice for them or a priest to pray for them. Jesus would no longer be needed his physical presence even to offer prayers for them because now they will be able to go directly to the Father himself. Jesus is describing for, him, for them in this new day the personal loving relationship that God's children will have with God the Father forever after his resurrection. His disciples answer him here in just a few verses with the fact that they do believe, they do believe now that he has come from the Father, but actually they only believe a little bit of it. They don't understand yet everything that's going to happen in the next few hours. Their faith is not yet complete, but it will take his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the Holy Spirit to truly change their lives and their understanding forever. But before that happens, Jesus knows that they will fail him in a dramatic way, even though they believe he came from the Father. Look at verse 32 with me. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, even though all of his disciples abandon him at his arrest and Peter verbally denies being his disciples, Jesus never wavers. Jesus never wavers. His strength does not come from the people he knows that are going to fail him. His strength never comes from the people that are around him. His strength comes from his dependence on the Father he has willingly submitted his life to. Jesus abides in the Father. That's where his nourishment comes from, is from the Father. And his final words here, as we end what's called Jesus' upper room discourse, are meant to give us all courage as we remain in the world, abiding in him. Because just like the disciples, we are in this world. Our world, just like Jesus is, is filled with opposition and evil and hate and persecution. We see it around us uh, in varying degrees every day. But we can be courageous. He tells us that here because he, and only he, has turned our tribulation today into triumph forever. By his work on the cross, he has defeated evil. He has defeated hatred and persecution and every sin and even death. Regardless of what we face, we can live every day in victory because of what he has done for us on the cross. He has overcome the world. Look at Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Be courageous, my friends. Be courageous because as we remain in this world, abiding in Jesus where we get our nourishment, our connection, we can live every day in complete victory over sin and over death because he won that for us. He has overcome the world. Pray for me. Pray with me. Father, you are great and 
good. It is true that our Lord Jesus came, lived a sinful life, died an atoning death for us on the cross, and he has um, given us that victory that we're able to walk in every single day. Father, I pray that we would be women that are intentional and are courageous as we walk in that victory. I thank you for these women that love you, that love your word, that um, abide in you and stay connected to you for their nourishment and their great peace. And I pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.